Sam. Thanks, Sam. All right. Good morning. Where are you guys? Gonna be glad. We only have one chapter this week. Yeah, I got an extra hour of sleep. I just slept in. Didn't study. Figured Judy would teach. Huh? Exodus chapter 32. We're continuing our uh, uh, journey. All right? The Exodus of the Israelites. Out of Egypt. One of the key words they wanted me to bring to your attention or the question they wanted me to ask you that we'll be reading, right? It's a question. Moses asked the Hebrews, right? He said, who is on the Lord's side? What does that mean? I say this because I'm uh, purposely been driven lately. I've been watching some videos and things that, that, that actually are kind of along the topic of Exodus. And, and uh, this guy is doing the interview. Everyone he asks, he says, are you a good person? He said, yeah, I'm a good person. Huh? <laughs> well, do, do, do you believe in the afterlife? Well, no, but I'm a good person. <laughs> if you if you did believe in the afterlife and you believed there was a God and he were to judge you after you were dead, which realize this is, in his opinion, God's opinion, the wages of your sin is death. We're all going to die. Have you lied? Have you cheated? Have you stole? Committed adultery? They all, they all say yes. And he says, are you still a good person? Yes. In God's eyes, what? You've broken the Ten Commandments, right? The ones he originally gave the Israelites, right? To help steer their path. Um, down the way. So, what does it mean to be on the Lord's side? Now, we know. Let's take. Let's 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 agree. God sent His Son, Jesus, the one and only perfect sacrifice. He died on the cross, shed His blood for the whole world's sin, mine, and even Judy's. <laughs> so there's no doubt trust me me and Judy we've received that special gift right of Jesus Christ right we've received forgiveness of all our should I can I say stupid on the internet I can't say it around my grandkids right all of our sins, laziness, tiltiness, but what's it mean to be on the Lord's side? If you were a Hebrew and you were answering that question, what would that mean? I don't know you may not have the perfect answer because I didn't either. But they gave me an answer. And think about this, on the side of truth, this, there's a long answer here. On the side of truth, holy, having charity is what? Love. Then it underlines his worship and ordinances, his people, his ways. And being jealous of his honor, right? His 
is his. It's all about him. It's not about us. Right? So is he on your side? What is the next question? If you're on his side, is he on your side? How so? I'm going to say your answer is yes. Right? Or we wouldn't be here today. How so? How's he on your side? What? If God's for you. <laughs> Nothing can stand against you. Well, he was on the Israelite side. We know that, right? From way back. And more so recently, in the last three months, right? He's given them food to eat, bread, manna to eat, meat in the evening. What was it, quail? Yeah, was it quail? Yeah, I believe it was quail. Every day. Crossed the Red Sea on dry land, destroyed Pharaoh. These are the people that had them in bondage for 400 plus years. So God is on their side, and has been on their side. Time and time. When they wanted water, what did they do? Moses, you brought us out of Egypt to die of thirst. We'd rather go back there and die in a grave than just to dry up out here like dust. But what did he do? Gave him water. Everything they needed. In the past, what? Their whole lives. He's given to them. So, there's a little section here they want me to read for you. I'm going to read this. So, here, it, barely three months. That's where we're going to begin today. Three months. They've only been out of Egypt for three months. You know how long they're going to be in the wilderness? How long? Forty years. They've been out of Egypt three months. Look what God's done for them already. Right? Because they are his people. His people. Right? So basically, okay, I'm going to read a few things today. This is good, good though. I thought this was Barely three months had passed, right, since Israel fled Egypt. Okay, I'm going to read this. God's people escaped their captors, passing through the Red Sea on dry ground. When they ran out of food, God provided quail and manna. A pillar of fire by night, cloud of day, assured them of God's presence. But now the people desired an image to represent the omnipotent God who had accomplished all of this. Now what's an image? Graven image, right? It's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not have any graven images. What are they doing? Worship. Last week, we wrapped up the lesson. I had to go back to this. Remember last week, we were talking about in the tabernacle, they built the uh, altar of, I call it altar of incense, right? It was the place where they burned incense. It's not the place where they sacrificed, right, animals. It's where they worshipped, right, outside of the holiest of holies. And remember, there was a point in the lesson, it was really good. They were saying, you know, all this other stuff had to be made, had to be taken accounted for, right? Including the sacrifices, right? The forgiveness. But then there's worship and holiness, right? That's due him, right? So let's do this. Let me begin. I'm going to um, read... Um, one more section here, and we're going to dive into our lesson, okay? I'm going to read this out of my lesson, because I love this. It's really good, because I don't always think these are that, that good, okay? But they're not scripture, but it's going to give us a warm-up for what we're about to read, okay? So take this into account. It says, Moses was alone on the mountain with God. Remember, Moses took um, Joshua, I don't know if you remember, a week or so ago, Moses went into the mountain, and he took Joshua, and he told Aaron, he said, you stay down with the hombres, right? Keep them happy. Me and Joshua are going up to talk to God, right? Then Joshua stayed, and God said, you come on up, 
Moses, right? Down in the valley at the base of the mountain, right? Aaron yielded to the demands of the people, right? All of a sudden now Aaron is Moses. He's in Moses' shoes and he's got what? A million plus or two, right? Of people to be happy. Right. Aaron yielded to the demands of the people. He said, Moses' absence for 40 days. So when Moses left, he was gone a long time. Uh, they weren't quite sure what happened to him, to be honest with you. I mean, 40 days is what? That's, that's over a month. A month and a half. Moses' absence of 40 days and nights led to the impatience of the Israelites. Golly, do you remember Wednesday night? What did Mark preach on? Or teach and preach on? Seemed like that word impatience came up a lot. Remember? There was some indication the Israelites thought, I'm reading this to someone show. There was some indication the Israelites thought Moses had abandoned them completely. Their consensus seemed to indicate that since Moses was gone, perhaps his God had also departed. His God. The answer to their dilemma was to have a God among them, one who could be seen and one they could consider to be a more reliable God. So they're going to make one up. The pillar of the cloud was on the mountain with Moses. Remember, this is the pillar of cloud. It's been leading them for the last three months across the wilderness. They had neither the man of God nor the token of God's presence among them. Their desire was to have something or someone tangible. Meaning what? See, touch, caress, pour oil on, whatever you do. Right? Their desire was to have something or someone tangible with them to direct them as they continued their journey. The delay led to the demand for a visible token of their God. Okay? So while I'm almost done here. While Moses was on top of the mountain, Satan was at the foot of the mountain. Okay? Causing strife among the people. They soon forgot what? Forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. They made a calf in Horeb. Horeb is Sinai, Mount Sinai. So this week's lesson is about the golden calf. Anybody ever heard about the golden calf? Huh? You all have? Oh, then I don't even need to continue. I, I'm kidding. We, we know 600,000 men left Egypt. It didn't say. Seems like it would be. It seems like it could be a lot, though, right? Yeah. A lot of gold. Yeah. yeah, we're going to read that. That's true. Okay, they made a, a calf in Horeb. I say, worship the molten image. Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forget God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. Right? Now, if you go back to the Egyptians or whatever, they've got a God for everything. They got one God of the sun, God of the moon, God of the stars, God of sex, God of fertility, God of uh, food, God of grass, God of cows that eat grass. So that's what they've got. That's what they wanted. Okay, let's begin reading. Chapter 31, I'm going to jump back one verse, okay? Verse 18 of chapter 31 says, And he, this is God, he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, that's Horeb, okay? Or Horebish, okay? 
Two tables of testimony. Tables of stone. Written with the finger of God. Okay. Roll back. Remember we talked last week? Was last week we were talking about the, the um, Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Testament? There were some things that went in there. Well, these are two things that are supposed to go in there. And they go behind the veil. After that point, no one's touching them because the lid stays shut, right? And they only carry it around with two poles when they're allowed to move the, the ark. Okay, verse, verse 1, chapter 3. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, some of this may sound like I'm repeating it, but this is a scripture, okay? When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron. Oh, and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. I mean, you what? We, know, we don't know what's become of him. So guess what? Oh, Aaron, what we hear happen is not necessarily what Aaron says happened later on. But they... Obviously, a lot of pressure there, too, right? How many people? Lots, right? Huh? Well, they're, they're the, if, depending on how you read this, <laughs> I was trying to read it that way because that's the way I interpret it, right? And Aaron said unto them, he said, Break off the earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Now, I'm not an earring expert. I'm assuming that there are things that dangle below their ear, right? Aaron says, break them off. They're gold. Break them off. Bring them to me. Feel free to chime in. This is, this is good. And he received them at their hand, fashioned it with a graving tool, however that, that goes, after he had made it a molten calf. What's that? I guess basically means he, he formed it into a, yeah, yeah, I don't know how he did it. But it was a calf. I don't know how big it was. doesn't tell me here. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. All of a sudden, what? Forget about him. We'll go to our ox that eats grass. Say it again. It sounded either he was willing or he was really scared. Right? I don't know. But let's find out. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord, right? And they rose up early on the morning and offered, okay? I've got to change my page. I've already torn one of my new pages, by the way, Butch. They rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings, right? And brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink. And rose up to play. So they built an altar around this golden calf so they could make sacrifices to for whatever. No. Or, let me put it this way. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on, on uh, graven images, right? I don't really know how that works. I can't get that in my mind, Jim. I can't imagine looking at a banjo and giving God praise over this beautiful instrument. So it's got to be false, right? Looking for some, if someone else has an opinion, Feel free. But they needed a visual 
something they could touch, they thought, in order to praise the Lord. We got our case out. Yeah. Let's finish this verse, uh, and then we'll we'll continue that discussion. Right. They rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, first of all, rising up to play, they didn't raise up to play badminton or wiffle ball, or kickball, right? Rising up to play is sexual, most likely, and most likely in congregational fashion, right? Doesn't say more than that there, but there's other uh, scriptures in the New Testament, even Paul referenced things like this. So bottom line is, this, this is just not a good, this is a party, okay? This is a a wild party, right? That's what Anna said. She knows. She's just... <laughs> Verse 7. Okay. And the Lord... Okay, let's go back up on the mountain. The Lord said unto Moses, He said, Get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. God knows this is going on. And Moses doesn't. But God is telling him. Right? He said, They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Right? These be, talking about the molten calf, these be thy gods. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Anybody ever call you a st- I, my My dad didn't call me a stiff neck. He called me other stuff. But what, what's stiff neck? I mean, stubborn? Stubborn? I see it in Scripture a lot. Okay, but verse 10 says, Now therefore, this is God talking. He said, Let me alone. What's he says? Go. Yeah, get. Not... Let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them. My wrath. So God, what? God's ticked, isn't he? But I love this. He says, and that I may consume them. What's that? Destroy them. Now hold on. Put your seatbelt on. And I will make of thee a great. I will make of thee a great nation. He's telling to Moses. What's he saying? God didn't necessarily change his mind about his goal right here. But it almost sounds like with those bunch of dudes down there, they're not making this very easy. Right? So he was going to get rid of them. It sounded like. You tell me how you interpret that scripture. Anyway? Okay. I love this. And Moses besought the Lord. I love this. Moses besought the Lord and said, Lord, why dost thou wrath? Hot, excuse me, I'm going to say it again. Lord, why doth thy wrath hot wax, wax hot, excuse me, against thy people, which hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power with a mighty hand alright so Moses is saying but God look at all you've done to demonstrate and now you're going to wipe them out he could right he could mean you like that Verse 12. This is Moses. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Mischief meaning for harm, right? People would just say, 
What kind of God is this? He brought them out here to the wilderness just to kill them. Right? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. He's begging. Right? Verse 13 says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's 400 years ago, this is dad. Israel is Jacob. His dad is Isaac. His dad is Abraham. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed. They shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented. Not of sin. He changed at least his immediate plan of destroying his people, right? The Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Moses turned, he went down from the mount, and the two tab- tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other, other were they written. He says, in the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God. Graven upon the tables. You don't know what that looks like. You don't know how big they are. You know, you can carry them. When Joshua heard the noise of the people, remember Joshua went up most of the way with Moses. When Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, he said, there's a noise of war in the camp. One of those parties Anna was talking about. He said, it's not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. 99 bottles of beer on the wall, 99 bottles of beer. I don't know what they're singing. And it came to pass, in verse 19, came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp, Then he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. (laughs) So when Moses was with God, he said, God, don't destroy your people. And Moses goes down, he says, he's hot, right? He saw the calf and dancing. Moses' anger waxed hot. He cast the tables, what? Cast the tables out of his hands. I didn't see it. It was just a movie. It didn't add a... <laughs> Broke them. Cast the tables out of his hands. Break them beneath the mount. No one's died yet. The verse 20 says, He took the calf which they had made, burn it in the fire. Ground it to powder. Strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Now, I'm not saying, I don't know what that exactly means, meaning whatever their water supply was, I gather he ground it up into dust and <laughs> cast it in to the water. He's assuming that's the water they drink from. I don't get the, I don't have the idea that there was any sort of service that went on that you guys all drink a cup of this or anything silly like that. That's my interpretation. Okay? Moses said unto Aaron, here you go, Jim. Moses said unto Aaron, he says, what did, his peop- what did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon him? Talking to his brother, Aaron, right? The one he left in charge. Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. He said, thou knowest the people, right? They are set on mischief. 
For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. Did I read that wrong? Let me read that again. For they said unto me, this is Aaron, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man they brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. So they're talking to Aaron, right? Here's Aaron says, I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. I cast it into the fire. And there came out this calf. <laughs> He didn't, he didn't have anything to do with putting it together, right? I mean, it's sort of, sort of hiding his, his guilt there. But anyway, we're almost done. Because we just have one chapter today. When Moses saw the people were naked, right? For Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. Now, I looked this up. I said, naked? I mean, I know they're having a good time down there, right? That doesn't necessarily... I don't think naked here necessarily means literally they don't have clothes on. I mean, some of them may not. I don't know. But they're obviously they're out of, also out of control, right? They'd had their earrings ripped off. I mean, maybe that was something that was obvious to Moses. I don't know. But whatever he witnessed there was obvious to him that things were out of control. Verse 26, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? There you go. Beginning of today's lesson. Let him come unto me. All right? All the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Now, who's Levi? Well, Levi was one of the sons of Israel. One of the twelve sons. One of the stones, right, on the high priest's breastplate. And Moses was a Levite. Aaron was a Levite. And the job of being and managing the tabernacle, right, was the job of the Levites. Let them come unto me. All the sons of Levi gather themselves unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, he said, Put every man his sword by his side, go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. The children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Now, I don't know if it was just that day was 3,000 the next day was another 3,000. The next day, I don't know that. It didn't say that. And I'm not trying to exaggerate it, right? Because there were a lot of people, right? 3,000 just seems like a nip in the bud. But maybe it was just the specific group of people that seemed to be um, all excited or involved in this uh, chaos that had gone on just since you know, the calf was built. That's all I can say at that point. So, on that day, let me find my place. Good, thank you. For Moses had said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son, upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. What's consecrate, Randy? Set aside for sacred Right? Purposes. Consecrate yourselves to the day. Now, we're almost done. And it came to pass on the morning, right, that Moses said unto the people, he said, Ye have sinned, a great sin. Now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. Or perhaps I'll make an, you know, I'll, I don't know, I'll, I'll convince God that this is, you know, just silly play that he can over, overlook. But you know what's crazy? Is this, uh, you know, it's a clock. Um, 
these interviews I've been watching. I love I, I love to watch them because I love the expression on people's faces, you know, especially the ones that receive the Lord, right? It's like, if someone has sunglasses on, you see the tears starting to roll on their sunglasses. Um, and they asked, they said, you think God's happy with you right now? I mean, if, if, he, if he did give you Ten Commandments, and he said, no way will you break these commandments, right? You know, in the Old Testament, that, this is the Old Testament, I'm not preaching legalism here, but in the Old Testament, using the Lord's name in vain was punishable by death. God takes all his, everything God's done is taken very seriously. Sometimes we, I mean, we, we, the, we, we people who love Jesus know what he's done for us. Tennessee still takes some things very casually, right? In decisions we make, things we see. In other words, it's, I'm not going to say it's okay, Right? But let's continue. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, okay? In your mind, there's like this dash. You have this dash? I don't know what that means in my Bible. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, he said, and if not, this is Moses talking to God, he said, blot me. I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Now, we're not sure what that book is for sure, right? I mean, it could be the book of life. Uh, um, it could be the, the book of those we're going to allow to go into the promised land or some other book. But the thing I loved about the scripture was Moses' passion for these people. He didn't even want his job. He didn't, don't meet, don't send me, God. Find somebody else. God said, I will. Your brother. I'll send you. All the work and labor, you know, that Moses did. And he could just say, blast him. Just give me another group of Boy Scouts. He loved his people. That's why Moses was very, very much, very much like Christ. The fact that his love for us was unquenchable. If thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, he said, Blot me, I pray thee, out of the book, which thou hast written. The Lord said unto Moses, he said, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. And they're heading where? To the promised land. Three years, what? 39 years and nine months from now <laughs> they get there. That was just play on words. But which I have spoken to thee, he said, Behold, my angel shall go before thee. Right? Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin. Upon them. There's coming a day. Someday. For all of us. Right? In the day when I visit. I will visit their sin. Upon them. Last verse. And the Lord plagued the people. Because they made the calf which Aaron made. Now, it doesn't tell me what plagued means here. Maybe when we go to the next lesson or the next lesson, we'll find out. Um, but there's one thing, right? What? Right, right. 
but, but I guess I don't know. I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't know the full answer to what plague means at this point. Meaning God knows, right? He knows how long they're going to be there. He knows how long they're going to just walk around and beg and starve and get beaten by other armies, other Canaanites, right? Excuse me? Yes. Still. Now, um, the, the thing I was um, thinking about when I read this is, is if you, look, and, and we're not there yet, we'll get there, is all these people that are on this journey <laughs> right now, none of them make it to the promised land. It's 40 years from now. I mean, 40 years from now, I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to be pushing up daisies, right? I mean, what is left of my physical teeth, right? But they're not going to make it. However, that's not necessarily just because of time, right? We'll find out in the scriptures later, right? God, that Moses doesn't even make it. He got to see it, but he didn't make it, right? And that's another lesson. So anyway, I don't want to bore you with that. Okay, I'm going to hurry up, and I'm done. Okay. I'm going to read something out of Psalms. I'm going to close for the day. Psalms. Psalm. You don't have to turn there. 106. Chapter 44. I'm sorry. Chapter 106, verse 44. If you read all of 106, it has a lot to do. And actually, whoever wrote this psalm, this particular psalm, right, reflects a lot back on the Israelites. But in 44, he says, Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry. In the next 40 years, boy, are they ever going to have a lot to murmur about. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry. And he remembered for them his covenant. And his covenant was what? Talk about that. He remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. He made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captives. Save us, O Lord God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say amen. Praise you the Lord. Anyway, if you want to, the reason I'm pointing that out is if you want to go back and read 106. It's a little bit long right now. I don't have time to read all. It, it goes through a series of events that will take place in our next upcoming lessons, right? And when 44 comes on, the verse, it says, nevertheless, he regarded their afflictions, right? He never denied them as his people. So, okay, that's all I think I have. Just want to stay in roll. Yeah, I hear a few minutes early.